Okay. Uh, welcome to all of you uh, to another edition of the Page Views webinar. Uh, we do four of these a year, and um, it's been really terrific. Uh, Rebecca Prime just suggested that this is kind of the Film Quarterly Book Club, and I love the idea of that, and some of you have been with us since the beginning. Um, so uh, this is a great session today, and um, one very near and dear to my heart. Um, these are all webinars based on the page views column that uh, Bruno Guarana does for us at Film Quarterly, now from his base at Boston University. And um, he does um, a kind of uh, uh, shortened book review, critique, introduction, uh, followed by a conversation with the author. And um, that's all in Film Quarterly, and it's always free on our website. So if you want to look back and see this in its entirety and see what others we've done, uh, just go to the filmquarterly.org website, and you can find the whole history. And um, at the same time, you can click at the bottom of that link, and there's a PDF of um, the introduction. Uh, we're here with Ross Melnick from UC Santa Barbara, um, and uh, the introduction to his book, Hollywood's Embassies, How Movie Theaters Projected American Power Around the World, that I've learned so much from, um, is up there. And um, you can sort of uh, follow up whatever interests you today in this conversation by just downloading that and taking a look. But enough of me. I'm going to turn this over to Bruno and to Ross. And uh, we're going to, I think we're going to begin with uh, Bruno kind of giving you an introduction to the book. It's just out from Columbia University Press this month, so you may not have it yet. And um, Bruno, I'll let you um, uh, let them uh, find out what it's all about. Thank you, Ruby. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, yeah, so today we'll be talking about Ross Melnick's new book, Hollywood's Embassies, How Movie Theaters Projected American Power Around the World. Um, and as Ruby said, just, this just came out last week um, and it's, it's a very hefty book. Um, we'll talk a little bit about its, its length and scope um, because it's, it's really impressive. Um, but just, just by way of a little introduction beyond what's already been written at Film Quarterly um, and, and to give you a sense of what the book is about, um, it really focuses on what I find to be a little discussed phenomenon, uh, which is a proliferation of American owned and operated theaters around the world. Um, even though much has been discussed about the nearly total supremacy of American film products in the global market, the book really addresses instead of that, the operation of brick and mortar structures from movie palaces to theater chains and how they provided audiences around the world with a distinctively American film going experience. So throughout the book, Ross investigates why and how Hollywood invested so heavily in foreign exhibition and reveals how movie theaters functioned as what he calls cultural embassies engaged in spreading American soft power in strategic urban centers around the world. So rather than a strictly industrial history, which you might gather from, from the book's title, um, the book is in fact much more interested in the political and cultural repercussions of the exhibition strategy for both Hollywood and the national film industries that were somewhat invaded by these uh, foreign owned movie theaters. So um, Ross takes Hollywood as a point of departure for what turns out to be a global history of, of exhibition. And he employs this framework to reveal the persistent efforts by Hollywood towards a global dominion and to demonstrate that this expansion had a lot less to do with film and money than with American soft power. Um, and I think this is neatly encompassed by this, the term that he employs to refer to these American operations abroad, which is cultural embassies. Um, and I find this really fascinating because it reveals the diplomatic and ideological effects of these movie theaters that are at the core of Ross's uh, history here. But to me, it also requests Hollywood as Hollywood cinema is national cinema and here as imperialist cinema as well. And in fact, we only rarely think of Hollywood as carrying traces of, of a national culture in industry production. And, and as, as Ross's account makes clear, it is this, this, this national ideology that American um, companies are putting forth around the world. Um, so in many ways, what the book demonstrates with material evidence is that Hollywood sold 
with this global exhibition network, not just movies, but a culture, a lifestyle, and an ideology, all of which deliberately calculated. Um, there is a, a quote by the, the head of the International Division of Lowe's um, from 1949 that Ross quotes here um, that says that the company, his company, was selling America and American democracy in its overseas theaters, right? So, so that idea is very much um, um, stated out loud, out loud by these, these companies. The other thing that I wanted to point out about the book is that while it is global in perspective, in each individual chapter, Ross really takes it into a different region or nation and pepper, peppers that, um, that narrative with detailed anecdotes and explicit evidence of Hollywood's engagement in an impact on local cultural politics and industry. And I think as a result, we get micro historical accounts in places as varied as France, England, Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, Colombia, Cuba, Egypt, Israel, Kenya, South Africa, Japan, India, and China. And I could go on and on. There's, there's a lot of, of ground covered here. Um, and, and just to, to wrap up, I should say that this book was a particularly challenging one to write about um, and also to prepare for this interview because I always felt like I would fail to do justice to the scope of the history uncovered here. So I'll, I'll defer to the expertise of our guest um, to, to give us the details, right? And, and what's, really important, um, what's really important in the, these different corners of the world um, that I think the book does so well. Um, so it's hard to sort of paint the picture in broad strokes um, while at the same time conveying how deep the research goes um, into these, these different areas. Um, so I'll welcome our guest, Ross. Um, thank you so much for coming here and for sharing this wonderful research with us. This is, I've learned immensely from your book and I think it's, it's necessary reading for anyone interested in, in, in film going and film exhibition. exhibition. Um, and, and it's really uncovering something really new and groundbreaking in our field. Um, and I wanted to, to start by giving you the chance to talk a little bit about the scope of the book um, and how the research project came about, as well as correct me if, if anything that I said was was not really true to what your intentions in the book. <laughs> thank you, Bruno. So nice to be here and thank you for the invitation. And that was a beautiful introduction. I couldn't actually have done a better job myself. So thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> you know, the book began very innocently in 2003. Um, I was actually working on just trying to figure out why Lowe's executives were being sent to Paris uh, to work in Gaumont cinemas, and I couldn't figure it out. And that led me to the Gaumont Low Metro Agreement, which was an agreement between MGM and Gaumont, where they were running cinemas, not just in France, but also in, the, uh, in North Africa and the Levant. And then that began to look at the Le Paramount, which was the Paris Paramount Theater. And before you knew it, I was into three countries, then six, and then 12. And um, I kept promising Columbia a nice small book, and it kept expanding. Uh, so the point in which it got to about three dozen countries, which is where we are at the end of the manuscript here. You know, the, what I really tried to do with this book was to figure out why Hollywood was as popular as it was and tell a different story, not just about people's love of Hollywood movies, but the love of Hollywood cinema and cinema going and what Hollywood studios were actually trying to do through exhibition by establishing, as you mentioned, the sort of soft power uh, dissemination of both its ideology, its products, and as well as its experiences, that really going to these cultural embassies was about experiencing Hollywood. I talk about the way that to enter one of these cinemas was really to enter the United States, the way you would think about an embassy. Um, we think about that now through retail stores like McDonald's. We think about it through theme parks like Disneyland. But these were some of the first American businesses built in foreign markets, and as such, they were loved during moments of philo-Americanism and they were hated during moments of anti-Americanism. So they really were very charged, often popular, often protested, sometimes even bombed, uh, cinemas uh, operating around the world, which had really charged moments. And that's how it grew from being a kind of industrial history into one very much about uh, culture and politics. And, and you mentioned the term cultural embassies, which I already highlighted. Um, there is something that's also diplomatic in, in the engagement of these theaters beyond just the, the term that you add to it, which is the cultural aspect of it. Can you tell a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, you know, these were not just important for Hollywood. They were also important for the U.S. government because they were front-facing, public-facing venues. 
Oftentimes the premier of these cinemas would bring in presidents and prime ministers of nations. They were opportunities for engagements of high level political as well as uh, business leaders of a given country. They were opportunities to share not just uh, the idea of going to an American cinema and what America might be like, but there were opportunities to show uh, newsreels sometimes made in the United mm -hmm. States or for foreign markets, short feature uh, newsreels, you name it. Those kinds of um, direct delivery of American cinema, as well as, of course, American ideology, was one of the things that really gave uh, an opportunity, was sort of a beachhead, if you will, for Hollywood and, of course, for U.S. messaging. By building one of these cinemas, you could guarantee what would be showed. And if there weren't protective laws, you also could show American um, produced newsreels, which was very important, especially during the uh, kind of post-war anti-communist ideas, during the war, ideological war against the Nazis, and, of course, Ufa and the Nazis were also interested in building cinemas overseas. So this is really a kind of a multinational, hugely important thing. It's not just about building cinemas. It was really about securing kind of, again, ideological and cinematic beachheads for the U.S. government as well as the U.S. film industry. Right. And, and what's in it for Hollywood, right? If we think about Hollywood's domination already as is saturating movie theaters around the world, why was there a need for Hollywood to invest in sometimes building or renovating these movie theaters? Well, one of the things I talk about in the book is that there was no unified strategy. So I think we were increasingly getting more and more books like mine that really talk about a complex, messy strategy. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely what was going on here. Every studio uh, had a different reason for building a cinema. Every, it just changed from studio to studio, country to country, even decade to decade. So some were very invested in what I refer to as shop window cinemas, a kind of British term for these sort of uh, show windows, if you will, the uh, main cinema built in London, which would then exhibit the film in a kind of paramount way. And then exhibitors from across England could come and see how to present that film properly. Some people built those and Fox on the other hand, just bought cinemas en masse. So Fox bought chains that were in Australia and New Zealand and South Africa. They had a very different idea. And that idea of course was uh, buy up this, uh, these chains and therefore you could secure all these outlets for not just Fox, but other Hollywood films. The shop window model, these kind of cultural embassy models, which were in uh, places like Brazil and, and in uh, England, France, you name it, they were really about just trying to get one single cinema into a market to secure number one, the first run release, as well as in some cases they were there because they had very, very protectionist local exhibitors who just dominated a single market. And so just getting one cinema would give you an opportunity uh, to secure the, uh, the release of a major film from your company. The other thing they were trying to do was upgrade exhibition. So in some cases, what Hollywood was frustrated by was low grosses, like very low ticket prices. And they thought mm -hmm. by building these cinemas, they could do two things. One is they could essentially um, demonstrate how to build upscale cinemas, which could charge more money, which would give them more revenue. And the other one was really to direct competition, to essentially, in a way, kind of pressure all the local exhibitors to rise to that level that they had now introduced to audiences. And all of this was, again, about rising the level of money that they could take from these foreign markets. And of course, uh, over time, this changed. So, um, you know, the, the Warner Cinema that was in Havana was very much about giving, uh, expanding Warner Brothers into certain uh, areas of Latin America and the Caribbean. So each time they did this, it was always with uh, new ideas. In other cases, uh, Spiros Skouras, who at the time was the head of Fox, he really wanted cinemas in Egypt and Israel because he was an, a, a avowed anti-communist and he felt that he needed to have these cinemas there because Fox and other, other uh, Hollywood studios really were important parts of pushing back against communism. They thought that Hollywood cinemas and Hollywood films would be the best case for kind of demonstrating why to push against communism and towards a kind of, you know, uh, democracy and consumerism. And so these were always different reasons why they built these cinemas. And I think that's what was so complex about doing this research is it just was not one size fits all. And that's why I had to drill down so locally into the politics and the, and the culture and even regulations to figure out why Trinidad, why Cuba, why Brazil, why you know England in this specific moment. And what had happened many times and in, including England was that local exhibitors were really, really unhappy about Hollywood building cinemas there. And that's a whole other aspect of this book is that it's not just that Hollywood decided to do these things and the world opened them with, you know, with open arms. 
uh, it really was a, a process where sometimes they were welcomed in and sometimes they were heavily protested against and even boycotted in various markets for trying to build in these, in these areas. So in what's, what's interesting about that is that most people loved Hollywood films because local exhibitors needed them, but they hated often the incursion of American exhibitors building overseas because it was two things. It was one, uh, an, an encroachment on their territory. And number two, it was kind of a striking thing, especially for particularly proud nations to see the expansion of American commerce with a brand name straight, right on their main downtown streets, sort of exampling that America was spreading and it was not just spreading uh, its culture, but also its, um, its, its um, economics in foreign markets, right. especially those that were trying to be very protectionist. And you mentioned um, these theaters are also pushing for technological development. What were some of those that were really important for renovating non-American owned theaters and increasing their ticket prices? Well, in terms of technology, I mean, the two major things that were going on, of course, were the conversion to sound. And that was, uh, that was happening wherever Paramount was uh, uh, building and, or leasing cinemas. So whether that was the Cine Paramount in Sao Paulo or that was the Hogakuza in, uh, in Japan and Tokyo in 1927, the incursion of, again, synchronous sound technology was also complicated, no more so than, of course, in Japan, where the, the Benshi were such a part of the Japanese experience. And so pushing sound in there meant the possible loss of a really of a cultural form that was so important to Japanese cinema. And then when you think about the 1950s, uh, one of the reasons that Fox was building so many cinemas and expanding its chains in the early, early to mid 1950s was Cinemascope. Uh, they were expanding their widescreen technology and they needed these beachheads to sort of push back against the growing uh, spread of Cinerama, Cinem Cinemascope, Tadeo, VistaVision, and all the others. They really wanted these cinemas also to sort of expand and um, really emphasize Fox's in, you know, technological prowess and the need to expand markets for Cinemascope films at the same time they were making more and more widescreen films in Hollywood. So again, there are so many different reasons in so many different time periods that it's, like I said, it's never one size fits all. But I think um, that's just a little bit of, an, of a couple of examples of why uh, technology was part of that as well, as well as changes. I mean, even switching theaters, I mean, the Metro Paseo, which was in Rio, was actually torn down and replaced with the Metro Bovisto, which was itself a kind of uh, Dimension 150 house, a huge widescreen process. Mm -hmm. And it was a replacement of a... Um, kind of historic 1930s movie palace with a very austere, huge single screen cinema, very much along the lines of the kind of swap swaps that happened in the United States in the 1960s. Can I jump in for a second, Bruno? Um, I was just, I, I wanna follow up about that because of the way in which this looks so much at infrastructure and at the material manifestation of, of film. And I wanted to ask you, um, Russ, you have this great quote in your introduction because you, you're talking about a comparison with the Hilton hotel chains and how those are starting up and spreading around the world and what the differences were in architecture and style between the Hiltons and the movie theaters. And you say Hilton sold the local to the foreign, Hollywood sold the foreign to the local. And I really love that. I wonder if I could get you to expand on that a bit. Well, I think it's one of those things where we always imagine everyone else, very American centric point of view, we imagine everyone else to be the exotic. But of course, to, to foreign audiences, Hollywood was the exotic. So what was often being sold on the outside was a kind of art deco or other kinds of, of quote unquote, American or European styles. And then on the inside, there was this effort to really create a kind of uh, conformity and comfort, which was to give you that mixture of the exotic that would bring you in and the comfort of local architecture, sometimes even local students painting um, designs on sides of walls so that you got that sense of, I'm in a Hollywood space, but I'm also still within the nation. And then there was this kind of interesting collision between hiring American managers, because most people who ran these foreign cinemas were actually American managers. So Lowe's and Paramount would send their foreign managers from the US overseas to run a whole bunch of, man of, oper of, uh, of ushers and other employees who are all from that given nation. And in that way, actually, it really does mimic the way that embassies work, mm -hmm. where embassies have, again, a US head and lots of local employees. And what that allowed you to do then was to have all of those local customs, those local social mores and other things translated by the local employees who could say, no, no, you know, we don't, we, people sit here and this is how you should have the music and we really should have this kind of presentation. And this is how we should attract, uh, you know, women to come in through these kinds of retail displays. But then they would do that through by exoticizing the whole notion of, oh, it's a paramount 
it's a it's an MGM cinema, and that would give you that collision. So whereas with the Hilton hotels, they were really about bringing Americans to Egypt by representing a kind of Vegas style Egyptian hotel, but with a modern cast. This was really about trying to bring people in locally to the whole exoticism of Hollywood, but then not making them feel as if they were in some foreign, very dis discomforted space. And I, I always go back to the um, the kids clubs or an MGM, what we would call the cub clubs. So the MGM lion had cubs, which were for the kids. And it was really about making children feel very excited about having this kids club, which was for them, but it was also an, a great opportunity for selling Nabisco uh, products, Coca-Cola and other American products on, so that you would inc increasingly become a kind of global Americanized consumer with the idea of the Saturday matinee, which had been started, of course, in England and in the US, and then was expanded to India and Egypt, all under the aegis of the MGM Cub Club, which again, sold you the excitement of Hollywood, but then all of your friends. So you felt very comforted by the local, as well as the kind of global excitement of being inside the MGM cinema that cared very much about the local audiences. It's interesting to see this strategy targeting children, right? Because it is sort of a long-term strategy to have these, you know, childhood sort of be reflected on a, the culture of going to movie theaters um, that are owned and operated by American industries, right? Um, and also telling that it is taking place among other places in Bombay. Um, so, so to create sort of a culture that, that could perhaps um, sustain the, the competition with Bollywood films later on, right? Well, yeah, I, I think it's not, a, it's not a surprise that MGM ex did this right at the moment um, of, of nationalization, you know, of, of independence, I should say. So when uh, Egypt and India and other nations are specifically looking at independence and increasingly thinking more about the nation or even national cinema, MGM sees in that, in that next generation an opportunity to say, yes, yes, wonderful, you're, you're independent. You also still love Hollywood. And these are the things you love. You love Tom and Jerry. Uh, you love these kind of uh, short and feature films. So be independent, you know, be Indian, but also be an MGM you know, consumer, you know, being an MGM fan. And so it's, I don't think it's a, uh, I mean, it's, it's partly was an industrial strategy they had been doing, but it was also very much about inculcating and growing a brand new generation of moviegoers. And again, one of the reasons I think we look at cinemas as much as cinema is that that's not really clear if you're just looking at MGM films and thinking about distribution. That is a very specific mm -hmm. MGM exhibition strategy. And so one of the things that I always like about studying exhibition is that it's sort of quote unquote where the rubber hits the road, right? It's that it's exactly the local strategy being put into display within the walls. So it's not just about what's on the screen, it's about the screens themselves and the walls that hold them. It's about what does the movie theater represent and how can you see the corporate strategy happening in different markets and what does that tell you, not just about the films. Uh, and so I think the Cub Club is something that when you read it, is very clearly a strategy by MGM to create this next generation, but it's also really about trying to grab hold of a, of a world that's changing and, and looking at an, an audience that it's worried about leaving. Um, and it's also about cementing that relationship between the adults and children, because so many people write about going to uh, the Metro in Mumbai or the Metro in Cairo about, I went here with my dad and we always sat in row W. You know, I went here with my family and we always would go on after, you know, after school. So that it was very much about getting people wedded into a very emotional connection. And that's also one of the things, the affective relationship between these cinemas and Hollywood is really, really key and something I tried to pick up on in, in as much as I could. Can I follow up on that? Because you have a great anecdote uh, in the introduction about a particular club kid uh, named uh, Salman Rushdie. Could you just tell people that story? I thought that was great. Well, I mean, he writes about it in Midnight's Children. And, um, and I had the lucky opportunity to talk with him when he was at Emory and I was working on this research. And I had just mentioned to him that I was working on this. And I did mention the Cub Club to him. And, you know, the way he is... He, I could just see a reaction, a twinkle in his eye when I mentioned the Cub Club. I think it's something that people who who experienced it, it's, you know, for anyone who has a sort of Saturday matinee uh, memory, I think it's one of those things that just stays with you because it was, again, 
you know, and he, you know, there's a lot of writing about the importance of the Wizard of Oz and other kinds of things within, um, within, you know, the relationship between MGM and, and his work. But I think it was just one of those experiences where um, I kind of understood, you know, just to see the resonance, you know, this many years later to still see that. And I talked several times in the book about different resonances, some good, some bad, you know, people who've built cinemas like the great Ivo Raposo, who built this incredible cinema in Conservatoria in, in Brazil, the, he rebuilt essentially the Metro Tijuca um, from his childhood. And it's one of the most incredible things you'll ever see if you have the opportunity to go to see it. Um, but there's also memories of people who, you know, even after MGM had let go of some cinemas, those cinemas were still being attacked during revolutions because people were saying that's a Yankee, if you will, cinema. That's a that's a Western cinema. They still thought the Hollywood owned these cinemas long after they did it because they had been such symbols of this kind of cultural and even political imperialism. So the legacy of these cinemas, although they're all gone now in terms of the ownership from Hollywood, they have remained in a way to be such symbols. And I think that's really another key part of why buildings are important to look at as much as the movies that played inside of them. I think you're mentioning the resistance, right? That, that some of the, these theaters faced um, in some places or even in, in places that they had been welcomed before, but that the political atmosphere had changed to the extent that the, um, the presence of American exhibitors wasn't as, as welcome anymore. Um, and, and I think back to the, the strategies, I forget which company did, but the strategies that were employed in Japan to um, absorb the silent film narrators as part of their strategies for exhibition and sort of um, creating this, this combination of American experience with local culture, right? Um, and then with the implementation of sound then and the firing of these narrators, um, then there was a lot of backlash against these exhibitors, right? What are other examples of, of the, the tension that was created once Americans, American theaters were not, not as welcome? So many things, uh, there's so many different parts of resistance in so many countries. I mean, uh, so if you look at Switzerland had a, had a really huge backlash against American intervention there, and this is all local legislation to push them out. The Dutch tried to keep Hollywood out uh, through the MBB, the National Trade Group. Um, the British launched a nationwide boycott against all Paramount films until they got rid of their two cinemas in Birmingham, what the trades refer to as the Battle of Birmingham. In Egypt, um, they were the cinema was attacked three times. People were killed. There were bombings. Um, this was, has to do with politics as much as it has to do with industry. Um, there are just so many examples of this kind of um, protest. And so this is not just an example of, you know, uh, excitement about Hollywood. This is really a very contested building. And I think, you know, it's just, uh, just reinforces again, the challenges of trying to expand. And I think in a way, Hollywood was learning these things on the fly. I think sometimes, you know, you could sort of see the, the, the US government was trying to figure out how to negotiate some of these challenges. Um, and the other resistances were, were racial. You know, there was, a, you know, the Royal Cinema, which was opened in the 1950s in, in what was then Colonial Zimbabwe or Southern Rhodesia. Um, it was um, protested heavily by, the, um, by, by groups interested in, ra in racial integration in um, Colonial Zimbabwe. And the Fox just, just would not integrate despite the resistance, even the pressure of the US government, State Department, which was really undermining uh, the, what the U.S. government was trying to do in Africa, especially during a, its kind of, again, anti-communist kind of messaging. Um, here was Fox running a uh, apartheid cinema where white, whites only in an area which had, quote unquote, multiracial partnerships. So it was possible for Hollywood to have integrated that cinema. And Fox just chose not to because they were, that organization was being run out of South Africa, which was itself uh, completely apartheid. So it was this challenge and it lasted for two years. It went from the Eisenhower through to the uh, Kennedy administration. It was a big um, eyesore and problem for the US government in Africa. So, you know, there are just a, a host of challenges and then there are all the wars, you know, that happened. So World War II, you know, uh, Hollywood lost a number of its cinemas in foreign markets. The Nazis took over the Paramount in Paris. Um, MGM had to get out of its cinema in Shanghai. Um, there are, you know, all told numbers of people who were interned and some died. And it's just, you know, there's, it's a very complex, messy, but it's as complex as the 20th century was. And then there's, 
some later developments that happened, which had to do with the changes in investment laws in China in the 2000s, um, and how Warner Brothers International Cinemas eventually pulled out of China with the changes in those laws. So the sweep of it, again, is about 90 years. And you can just mm -hmm. see the huge changes that go on, not just in the globe, but also in how these companies organize themselves and how, uh, how heavy was their interest in risk. Um, and I think that's another thing to think about is at some point it was a sort of risk reward strategy. Uh, when are these cinemas giving you the advantage of their, uh, of their construction? And when are they really recognizing and representing a certain kind of uh, exposure? to not just political challenge, but even an industrial one or legal one. So there's a lot of going on in this, in the, in the book, because there's a lot going on in that 90 years. Yeah, and, and these moments really, yeah. these no, moments really, was... really illustrate the, the entanglements of politics and cinema, right? That as your book illustrates so well, Ruby. Yeah, no, I was just gonna point out that a few, uh, we're about halfway through and some interesting comments are starting to come up in the chat that I want to just bring into our conversation for both of you. Uh, one is from uh, uh, our own Joao Luis Vieira uh, responding to the story about the cinema in Brazil and saying that the, recommending the Sentimento, a smaller version of the fantastic Metro Tijuca in Rio. So he's telling us, Bruno, the next time we come, we have to see it. And then uh, Chris Horak is following up on this last point that you were just making, Bruno, about these pricing structures and what you were talking about, Ross, and saying um, that one of the things that you talk about is how in building theaters, Hollywood also tried to raise the local ticket prices to make more money and that this was a move that was really resented by local exhibitors who saw their clients diminish when these prices got raised. So that's a really interesting point from Chris. Do you want to say anything about that, Ross? Well, I have two comments. First, the reason I went to the, the Centimetro is because of Joao, who took me. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and I owe him so much of what happened in terms of the research in Brazil. And of course, with the incredible visit to the Centimetro, which was, you know, I, I, I just can't say enough about it. So if you have no other reason to go to Brazil and you're a cinephile, you should go for that reason. Um, and then, you know, just as a, as a, a, a bit of admission, I mean, uh, you know, Chris, thank you for your question. I mean, I, I've, I've mentioned this in, in the book. The first time I wrote about this phenomenon was in Chris Horak's uh, European Silent Cinema course when I was a graduate Aww. student. So, so this is a, that was 19 years ago. So this has been a long gestating project. Um, the pricing structure, so thank you, Chris, always. Um, pricing structure, I mean, yeah, this was, this is a huge challenge because it was, a, it was an enormous amount of, of challenge to people who had to then reinvest a, a huge amount of capital. And one of the things that was happening was that I talked about this in the Australian New Zealand section was the importance of banks. Now I'm not a bank expert, but I had to learn a tiny bit about kind of international banking. Um, you know, there was a, the ESNA bank, which was in Australia had loaded up uh, Hoyts and Greater Union with a lot of debt. And it was Chase Bank here in the United States, which actually purchased that debt, if you will, from ESNA by basically giving the money to Fox to buy, um, to buy Hoyts. And one of the reasons for that was there was a, this came out in a number of hearings that were happening in the 1930s in Australia, was the pressure people felt like from the incursion of Hollywood, not just because they were being pressured to build more cinemas, but by the threat of building more cinemas. So one of the things that Hollywood would do was just sort of slightly threaten that they were gonna build cinemas. This is actually one of the, the things that I didn't covered a little bit about the Paru from that agreement, which was that Hollywood was also threatening to build cinemas in Germany. And so one of the things that was really important about getting that agreement together was to say that, well, we won't build as long as we get this, uh, we, have, we have a distribution pipeline for our films because there was always this threat that if we don't have access, we will begin to invest our money in terms of exhibition. And this is one of the things that happened uh, in a number of markets. And then, like, as I said, um, you know, there was also this push to try to really take over markets that were really oppositional. So one of those was South Africa, where Isidore Schlesinger really had dominion and control of that territory from the 1910s through the 1950s. And it was only with his death and the sale of the company by his son, uh, John, that actually Fox was able to take over a market that had really had to negotiate very poorly. So this had the other influence on Hollywood. When it couldn't get exhibition, it actually had very little control over its rental terms. So it had to negotiate from a very poor perspective. So there is a distribution side of this whole story, which is that when you can get your own theaters, you don't have to negotiate as much as you do with, with, uh, with exhibitors locally. 
how, how culturally specific were the offerings? I mean, were they replicating what was being rolled out in the United States at that time? Or were there particular tastes and particular so-called territories that they would appeal to that looked very different on the set of marquees than what we would see in the United States at that time? I'm curious. Yeah, well, that answer would be as complicated as the 36 different places I look at. But I mean, just as a couple of examples, I mean, I mentioned the newsreels already. In some cases, there were national laws against newsreels being exhibited that were not from the nation. So in some places, Hollywood created its own foreign newsreel, had them distributed in other places. They were forced to take the national newsreel. Um, there were even issues where um, they didn't actually, they forgot to give Portuguese translations to um, Brazilian cinemas. They gave them European Portuguese, not Brazilian mm -hmm. Portuguese translations, which were problematic. Um, in terms of the presentation, um, you know, uh, when you think about places like um, Egypt, the thing that was really fascinating is that many times because of the population, you'd actually have four different languages being screened or projected at the same time. So you might say have a Hollywood film and then either on projections on the side or on the bottom, you'd have uh, Greek, Arabic or French. And so you're getting this very kind of polyglot and very um, interesting transnational presentation of cinemas. You know, it, you know, I could go through so many different examples because there were so many different kinds of permutations. But um, I think one thing is that things changed, obviously, from the silent period to when you were having local kind of uh, orchestras, which were uh, different kinds of music, some of which were more quote unquote quote unquote local. Or we talked about the Benchy presentation, which was obviously very much a kind of um, culturally arbitrated one um, that's very different from what you would have that was in the US. But yes, they really did try in the quote unquote shop windows, they really did try to give everyone an exact replica of the United States. They even brought over simplex projectors, carrier air conditioning, the American seating company chairs, um, the designs by guys like John Eberson or Thomas Lamb were often replicas of theaters they had built in the United States. Um, so they tried as much as possible to really give you a local experience. I mean, one example of how, it's one of my favorite examples of how they tried to change things locally was uh, Clement Crystal, who had been the, who was the head of Paramount International in 1948, was very excited about building the Cine Tacna, which was in Lima, Peru, which had originally been a Fox uh, MGM, sorry, Fox Paramount uh, co-investment, but actually out of concern for the consent decree, which did not cover the foreign markets, but they were concerned that even the appearance of co-running a cinema in Peru would be seen by the Justice Department as collusion. Paramount gave up, sorry, Fox gave up that space, so Paramount ran it. Clement Crystal came back to the United States and was very excited to tell everyone that they had uh, essentially integrated Peruvian audiences. As you may know, there was a lot of uh, kind of uh, skin privilege in, within Peru and a lot of uh, racial uh, segregation. So Clement Crystal was very excited to come back and tell everyone that unlike other exhibitors, we Paramount have integrated uh, Lima, Peru to the Cine Tacna. This was a person who was working for Paramount in 1948, which had, you know, dozens of uh, segregated theaters throughout the United States. So it was like, sort of like, you know, do as I say, not as I do kind of um, just tone deaf kind of response. But there was this idea of like, a theory of what Hollywood should be, that it should be this democratizing factor, but then there was the, re the reality. I think that's often, I, I, to go back to that thing I mentioned earlier, kind of what Fox uh, engaged with, again, in Kenya and colonial Zimbabwe and South Africa. So local presentations changed everywhere um, in terms of how they were trying to deal with, again, uh, social, cultural, political, and even sometimes aesthetic issues, given the, the era, the studio, the theater and its location. Ross, there's a great question waiting here from Heidi Wasson, who says that it seems that the high tech spectacular approach to theatrical architecture is a, is a primary lens uh, through which to approach this, that technological imperialism is key, but she says it's also relative. Can you say more about the technological statement that these theaters made in context to the media and urban environments you're discussing? Absolutely. Are there any specifics there? That's a great question. Yeah, thank you, Heidi. Great question. Um, I mean, one thing is, so in I, you mentioned the Hilton hotels and Hilton always would talk about the sort of the radios that were piped into the rooms, the telephones, the air conditioning and the trappings of all that and the way they sort of projected this kind of modernity. So these cinemas were often in very interesting spaces. Um, and so they were also trying to project a kind of technological and architectural superiority slash modernity. Um, one of the people who built, uh, who actually was involved in exhibition in Israel, when they built the Fox Theater in Tel Aviv, 
actually said this theater is so sort of amazing because it has these kinds of seats and this technology that even quote unquote primitive people would appreciate the design. And uh, so much of what was actually going on was the situational space of cinema. So whether it was in the, um, the plaza uh, in, you know, in, in certain uh, South American cities or whether it was on a crowded streetscape, it was supposed to be um, the most exciting, the most elegant, the most neon lit edifice on the street. It was very much about projecting a kind of uh, American slash European modernity. Behind me, you're looking at uh, the cover of the book, which is actually um, Calcutta. And the idea of that cinema is that it's not supposed to be look like anything besides uh, a kind of modernity writ large. It's not, it's supposed to every MGM cinema, wherever it goes, is supposed to have a kind of um, uh, similar signage and Klieg light kind of premiere and excitement, which is supposed to replicate um, around the world. And then whatever it's supposed to go, the, the Paramount or the MGM or other buildings are supposed to be the greatest movie theater in that city. And that's again, to give you that sense that um, as S. Charles Lee said, you know, the show starts on the sidewalk, the famous theater architect. It was again, to give you that sense of Hollywood excitement the second you hit the streetscape. So while we've hidden all of our cinemas these days inside shopping malls and shopping centers, when there were so-called street cinemas, as they refer to them in Brazil or in downtown cinemas here in the US, um, they were there to project a very American uh, excitement. And so there is an often a very important part of the architecture is to give you that sense of, um, of its contrast, if you will, between what is on that street and how much uh, it's uh, exemplary by its architecture and its design. And you see oh. this in the cover of the book, which I really love, but the, the way people are dressed and getting into the theaters, it does become this event, right? And, and it also um, addresses a, a very much cosmopolitan audience. Um, which is yeah, like, and I think it also, it, it you know, it, it aligns a little bit of a class and racial conversation, yeah. you know, because that image, which of people in furs and very expensive cars mm -hmm. and it's kind of modernity is about how Hollywood was really projecting itself to middle and upper class audiences. And I was trying, hopefully, sensitive to that as much as I could be in most of these uh, spaces that, yeah, on one hand, it was very much trying to get, you know, Cuban audiences or Argentinian audiences into these cinemas, but it was really trying to get very specific middle class and upper class audiences in. And so we talk about the children who go to these club clubs, but it was trying to get a certain kind of child with a certain kind of wallet. To come in, and so I think that's where Clement Crystal's notice notation about his having desegregated Lima was probably, you know, on, on Lima's most fashionable avenue, um, you know, was a particular kind of of urban cosmopolitan, often trying to reach out to um, tastemakers, political business or otherwise, as well as their future generations. And so, whether again it was in Manila or Shanghai or or whether it was in Havana, it was a specific kind of audience that they were usually thinking about. Now, they definitely wanted to have a multi-class audience. It was good for business. It was good for ideology. Um, the reality is prices were typically more expensive than most other cinemas. And again, as I mentioned, that was on purpose because they very much wanted to bring up the revenue that they could in farm markets. In other areas, I will say that where they built cinemas and bought, excuse me, bought cinema chains en masse, they actually, this is Fox, often kind of hid behind. Mm -hmm. um, the, so they would keep the local branding. So Fox bought Hoyts and kept Hoyts. Oh no, every time they would have an objection, people would say, oh, it's an Australian company. And then when they were in, in New Zealand, amalgamated, now it's, no, it's a Zealand company. Meanwhile, it was completely run, owned sometimes almost 90, 100% by uh, the US company. So there were various strategies in various markets by various studios for different reasons. And so I would, I never really want to kind of paint everything with one brush, but I will say that the, the pricing model, especially when you look at Warner Brothers International Cinemas, which is really the last kind of big company that I stare at, uh, Saleh Hassanen, who was a very fascinating man who, uh, started out in Egypt working for Fox and then came to the United States and worked his way up to be really, you know, the probably the world's most famous exhibitor during the multiplex era. He came to Warner Brothers and their whole idea was that multiplexes would essentially establish uh, a new markets for Hollywood in higher prices and higher, you know, technological and architectural standards in the 1980s and 1990s. So there again, it was about bringing in the revenue streams, whether it was in Taiwan or it was in London or it was in um, you know, Portugal, it was about bringing in a new kind of Americanized and corporatized idea of, of movie going. So it was often 
about kind of trying to change not just what was being shown, but how it was being shown. I want to I want to try something else. I've always been fascinated with this intersection with the, between the politics and these movie theaters. You've talked a bit about it within these different countries, but you know, um, in the World War II period, I remember reading that when Rockefeller was uh, put into a key position in Washington and saw Argentina adopting neutrality in World War II and being too friendly with the Nazis, that he pulled all the American money out of Argentina and put it into Mexico instead. And it was the start of that whole shift. I've often seen it written about in terms of production. Did that affect the movie theaters as well? What was happening with that at that moment? Well, I write a little, I write a lot, actually, much more than I ever intended to write about um, World War II and Nazis and the, the kind of the, the kind of challenge in there. And I think one of the places that you could see that was in the ideological stances of Argentina and Chile versus the shift that was quicker with places like Brazil. And there's probably a very good reason, and it's pretty much the one you just stated, why Argentina didn't really get too much of American investment until the 1950s in terms of MGM cinemas, whereas Rio had three by the time you were in the 1940s. And it was very much about that switch, not just a good neighbor policy, but about the switch during World War II into trying to throw more investment capital into, into, into Rio and Sao Paulo, especially as UFO was also trying to establish cinemas inside Brazil. So you could see this, and I'm not, this is, Luis Navar Nazario writes about this, there's a lot of um, conversation about how do, how do theaters sort of uh, uh, create essentially, if you will, embassies for a kind of ideology. And so the Nazis were just as engaged as this as the United States was. And there was a little bit of a, of a cat and mouse game going on. Uh, UFO was trying to open cinemas in Cairo. Uh, Hollywood was trying to open cinemas in Cairo. UFO had cinemas in Brazil. Hollywood had cinemas in Brazil. Places where they felt that there was a possibility to shift uh, audiences and attention and even politics in kind of uh, tangential, but also then increasingly important markets where they could see not just a soft power reason, but even a corresponding hard power reason to um, soften up a place for the possibility of either governmental connection or even possible invasion. They were very happy to do that. So Hollywood was involved in that. And so were the Nazis. Movie theaters are just, you know, as always, they're not just... Um, they're not just walls and carpeting. They are. They really are places uh, for quote unquote community. And they're also for a place for ideological exchange. And I think newsreel houses always understood that. I think we've often given a little bit of short trip to the real importance of movie going and what movie theaters do, at, which is very different sometimes than just you know watching things alone. We have a kind of connection. There's so many stories, not just in this book, but in others where you have audiences yelling at each other audiences actually physically fighting with one another over the politics on the screen. So I think that that's well known. And I think that all of these companies and countries um, were understanding the importance of, of either letting in these cinemas or, or prohibiting them and the kind of content that they were putting up on the screen. I have a follow-up that I don't know if I wanna to get to just yet. <laughs> um, but, Go ahead, but you're Go for talking it. about the um, movie theaters are just not just being carpets and walls, right? Um, and and just to relate a little bit to our current moment, what, what kind of power would you say movie theaters project today? Well, or that's don't. a great, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a great question, right? I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm cognizant of the idea this is being recorded. So at some point, someone in five, 10 years from now is gonna look back and think, I can't believe this person thought in 2022, whatever I'm about to say. Um, I do mention at the end of the book that it's an irony that I'm looking at the power of movie theaters at a moment in which movie theaters probably have the least amount of power mm -hmm. that they've had in 100 years or more, actually. So I think that it's a question, and I'm going to try to balance it in two ways. One is it's been a heartening few weeks or months for movie going. Um, Paramount um, and Sony have actually really... Um, planted their flag in theatrical distribution. They've actually made that a real important part of what they're doing. Uh, the huge box office that Spider-Man and other films have had says that they understand that there's a real moment for theatrical exhibitions still left. Um, I think Disney and others are looking back again at theatrical exhibition after shoving things onto streaming platforms so much. Um, 
Having said that, um, it is a challenging moment because we've essentially broken the movie going habit. One of the ways that we just kept, we just sort of, it was like an equilibrium and a kind of continuance in all of our lives. We just went to the movies. And when you go to the movies, they show you trailers for other movies. And then you have that as part of your, well, it's Friday night, should we go to the movies? And so those of us who were cinephiles or those of us who just like going to movie theaters, that was something that broke. Um, in most places, you know, in China it actually has been a, a con almost consistency of going to the movies um, throughout the pandemic, but many other markets, France, US, and many others, um, things have been closed on and off. So movie theaters are in this weird space. And I, my, my sense of things is that the obituary for movie theaters has been written so many times that I think writing another one is probably folly. Um, movie theaters were supposed to die with radio because everyone wants to stay home. Then movie theaters were supposed to die in the depression because we didn't have any money for tickets. Then they were going to die in the fifties because of TV and then cable and home video and on and on, you know? And so I think something dramatic has shifted. I think in the United States, at least, I think the quotidian movie going experience is challenged. Um, we all don't have as much time. There's still absolutely a biological concern about being congregated within spaces. I think many studios have, um, have really uh, lessened up on the importance of theatrical exhibition, um, which is a challenge. And the question is whether or not Spider-Man and other films will encourage them to come back. But I think if you're a moviegoer and you can hear people like Edgar Wright, uh, Christopher Nolan, Quentin Tarantino, many others who are um, really huge you know, movie fans, some of whom even own cinemas, they are talking so much about the, how they want their films to be seen what they think movies should be, uh, what kind of position they should be presented in. And so I think the question is just, can we return people to going to the movie theaters? Um, will people want to go back? My sense is that yes, they already are. Um, you know, there's a number of films that are out right now, which are doing very well. The art house market is uh, returning to some semblance of, of stability. It's been a, that's been a very challenged market because you know, what's happening a lot these days with exhibition is that the big blockbusters are doing well and art houses are not. Um, and so that's been a real change this week. Everything everywhere all at once is, is doing a lot of business and that's very heartening for art houses. So I think that there's a real question uh, in the US market. Um, you know, there are interesting kind of things that happen with, with theaters. If you look at um, Russia, They've uh, Hollywood has stopped distributing films there. So the Russian cinemas are having trouble getting equipment, um, replacement equipment for the day that cinemas will run. They're starting to bring in films from India and China more. So there are all of these things that are happening. Ukrainian cinemas have reopened this week. I've seen some of the chains are starting to reopen their operations. And so it's a really fascinating a place. And I think, again, it's one of the reasons why exhibition isn't dead as either a, a venue, uh, a segment of the industry, or as an object of study, because they are still the place where culture, politics, and people transact, and where cinema has, if you will, its most, I think it's its highest level of primacy. It doesn't get buried in an algorithm and a long menu of options. When you walk into a cinema and you buy a ticket, you are choosing it, and you are uh, hopefully putting away your phone for two hours. And I think people are somewhat starved for that activity to really truly unplug. And so cinema does still provide that opportunity. So if you can get people to come back to movie theaters um, and people already are and get them back into the habit and studios actually wanna distribute things theatrically and not just entirely rely on streaming, I think we could see a return uh, to something close to, but I don't think ever again quite at the way we were before 2020. Uh huh. Well, I, 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 if we were at time, I'd say perfect ending. But instead, I want to go back a little bit to some of the more historical um, periods that you were talking about, because there's a question from Dudley Andrew that was in the chat asking you whether the Japanese majors used similar strategies in the 30s and 40s in Taipei, Seoul, Shanghai, Manchuria, and then later in Brazil and even uh, the Toho Labre. Like, did, did you see these kinds of, of, of strategies being deployed there as well? Um, by the Japanese majors? It's an interesting question. It's a great question. Um, so yeah, you mentioned Toho. I mean, Toho is probably the best example of that, which uh, Toho opened cinema in Sao Paulo in the Liberdade neighborhood, which is you know, the Japanese neighborhood of Sao Paulo. They opened cinemas in New York and in Los Angeles. Um, what's different about that was that Toho 
took over smaller cinemas to kind of create, they were in a way kind of shop windows again for Toho films, but they were almost uh, art house uh, shop windows, different than what Hollywood wanted to do, which was these big, you know, uh, showcase theaters with thousands of seats and kind of create this kind of spectacle. I think what Toho recognized was to really establish the idea that people wanted to see their films and they wanted to see them consistently. And so again, I think from my reading at least of what's happened in New York and Los Angeles was that Toho really wanted to have uh, essentially again, kind of a beachhead and a guaranteed outlet for its films where it wasn't trying to negotiate slates where they were your, you know, French films and British films and German films were trying to get into art houses. They wanted a place where Toho would have their, um, their, their front uh, facing kind of venue. Um, outside of the outside of the those three, um, it wasn't as big as far as I can tell um, a, a expansion into other areas of Asia. But I didn't. I will be honest with you. I did not do a lot of that research because I started getting into. I will tell you. I started getting tempted to do that. Um, I started working on rank because one of the things I gesture at but don't talk enough about because I this book was already long enough was how much rank the UK based rank was also involved in the exact same thing as Hollywood. They were buying and building cinemas overseas to guarantee British exhibition, British distribution. Um, I mentioned already UFA was doing that. So I started looking at those things. There were definitely um, the takeover of Chinese cinemas by, uh, by Japan during, during the thirties. And so there's some of that in the book, but there's a long history and a much more uh, maybe fascinating history that I don't know about that has to do with your question. And I, I hoped maybe with this book that someone would begin to, other people would pick up that other parts of the story. This is not just something that Hollywood did. Um, there's increasing conversations now about all of the South Asian exhibitors in Africa um, who ran Indian cinemas, Indian language cinemas um, that, were, um, that were very much a part of what was going on in East Africa. And so I think that the opportunity to expand our understanding of how these uh, films and, and, and companies operated globally is something that I'm very excited about. And I think this is my book, if, if you will, is like a, hopefully an opening foray into a much more complex conversation um, about this kinds of infrastructure. So your question is a great one, Dudley, because um, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for thinking much more uh, expansively about that. And I did my best at the end to talk about um, Dali and Wanda, which is a you know, Chinese company, which has had such an influence on exhibition over the last 10, 20 years, uh, which actually started out as a partner of Warner Brothers in China. So it's it, these histories are interrelated and complex. And um, I think uh, there's a lot more opportunity for investigation. Well, thanks, Ross. Thanks, Bruno. This, is, it, this has been such a great conversation to have at this particular moment in time when I think we've all had such a yearning for movie theaters to survive and to reopen again, at least some of us of a certain age, but I think a lot of people, and for the liveness, the liveness that movie theaters provide in contrast to um, our, our Zoom experiences. Um, I think this has been a very live Zoom experience, but I know that like everyone else, I'm eager to get back into um, closer proximity with screens and audiences. So thanks for bringing this to us at this particular moment. It's been wonderful to hear you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And thank you to everyone for those great questions. And thank you for the opportunity to talk more about the book. It's been great. Great. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody. See you again. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>